in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, if you will, the Gospel of Matthew, and I'd ask that you find chapter number 18, the Gospel of Matthew and chapter number 18, and together we're going to spend some moments looking into the Scripture and asking the Lord to speak to our heart. My, my heart uh, really, really beats and bleeds for revival. I want to see the Lord bring revival to our land and to our nation. We desperately need it. Amen? Uh, I certainly am for foreign missions and am grateful to the Lord for that. Uh, my wife, uh, not too long ago, went to Kenya, and we're very grateful for the opportunities the Lord gives to take the gospel around the world. But I want to tell you that now America is the fourth most pagan nation in the world. And ladies and gentlemen, we need revival in our land. Now, to have revival, you've got to first of all be vibe. The only candidates for revival are those that have been vibed. Who's listening to what I'm saying? And so judgment must first begin at the house of God. It's not my brother or my sister. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I am constantly reminded of the reality if I were half as angry over my sin as I am the sin of others, I'd already have revival. It's easy for me to curse the darkness and get caught up in playing the blame game of blaming everyone else for the ills of our culture but we must come to grips with the reality that if we're not having revival, we owe it to our neighbors and our family to look them in the eye with integrity and apologize because we're God to choose to sovereignly bring revival to our nation. The only people he could use as conduits through which he could bring revival are those of us that have tasted grace. It's easy to blame this crowd or that crowd. We must look in the mirror and say, not my brother or sister, it's me. And I need to repent. It's easy for any of us in particular, people like myself in ministry, to get so caught up in pointing fingers and hurling insults at others and saying it's time for you to repent, but I must repent. I must be willing to respond to God. It's one thing to come and hear the word and absorb the truth. It's another thing to obey what I hear. In fact, we're heaping to ourselves greater condemnation and wrath and judgment to expose ourselves to the truth of the Word of God with no intent and no, no heart to obey what we hear. James would say to look in the mirror and see what manner of man you are and to go your way ignoring what you've seen. And so as we're exposed to the truth of the Word of God and we hear the Word of God as the Word of God, may we say amen to what we hear with our life, not just merely with our lips. May we carry it out. May we obey it. Amen. Well, I've been praying this afternoon about tonight and the service this evening. And if, if you don't mind, if you don't have anywhere to go. That's what I used to say when I'd preach in prison. Can I get an amen? I'd say, if, uh, if, you, don't have any, <laughs> if you don't have anywhere to go, <laughs> uh, I, I just feel we need to clear off a path and have church. Is that all right? I mean, it's just us here. And so let's have church. Now, with that in mind, with that backdrop in mind, if you were to wake me early in the morning and say, Preacher, in your opinion, what is one of the greatest hindrances to revival? Hmm. In no way would I want to oversimplify the issue, but I would look at you and I would say to you, it is an unforgiving spirit. Because we're never more like Jesus than when we're willing to forgive, and we're never more like him than when we're unlike him then we're not willing to forgive i mean how would you like to come to the altar tonight and say lord forgive me and him say no and so i want to talk to us this evening on the subject of forgiveness and my prayer is that we'll just come with an open heart that says lord the answer is yes now you speak i sign the bottom of a blank sheet of paper you fill in the blanks the answer is yes you speak i'll join you where you're at work so with your Bibles open, if you'll stand tonight as we give honor to the reading of the Lord's Word, and as we hear all that going on out there, we thank God we're in here. Amen. You'll want me to keep you late tonight. Matthew chapter 18, and might I say thank you for having me here today and for praying for your pastor. You've got a jewel, you've got a great gift that the Lord's given to you. And you love on that man and his wife and those precious kiddos. And man, you just encourage them. Walk up to them and 
roll up a couple of hundred dollar bills and put it in their hand. Why are you folks laughing? I'm telling the truth, man. And just love them and bless them. And uh, I have been privileged to preach in the church where they pastored before coming here. And you know, you can tell a lot of guy about a guy when you go to the church where he was. And I'm going to tell you what. Those people in Tennessee love Brother Jim. And every time I go, they speak so highly of him. And so the Lord's blessed you with a great gift. And to whom much is given, much is required. Amen? And so you take care of him and you love him. And boy, I just love seeing those kiddos in church. Makes me ready to go home tomorrow and see mine. Amen? If my little girl was here, she'd be running laps and tearing the place up. She's just like her mom. How many of you know what I mean? All right. If I want to know that, I'll tell her you mind your business. All right? Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. They came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now notice this, church. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Father, speak to us tonight and give us the grace to hear your voice and grant us the grace and the liberty to obey you at once. Help us not argue. Help us not fight. Help us not want our way. Help us join you where you're at work. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. You can be seated tonight, church. Someone has said, we are never more like Jesus than when we are willing to forgive. We are never more unlike Jesus than when we are unwilling to forgive. To put it another way, these words were penned many years ago. They say, to dwell above with the saints that we love, that will indeed be glory. But to dwell down here below with the saints we know, that is another story. (laughs) It's not always easy to get along with one another. Can I get a witness? It is not always easy. Not long ago, I was asked the most interesting question I believe I've ever been asked in my life up until that point. I had a teacher in school that would always say to me, he'd say, Now, Chaddick, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, I want you to know his theory was blown out of the water because that night, I was asked the most ridiculous question I've ever been asked in my life. A lady walked up to me after I'd preached. No doubt she was sincere. And she looked at me and she said, Preacher, do you and your wife ever argue? Well, I looked at her and I I met her on her level and I said, Absolutely not. My wife and I have never had an argument. All these years we've been together, not one fuss, not one fight, not one disagreement. We've lived in wonderful marital bliss all of these years and let all of the people say amen she looked at me and she said do you really mean that I said oh no not really at all we don't fight but we have an intense moment of fellowship and the neighbors can hear us 10 miles down the road amen someone asked my wife the other day said do you wake up grouchy in the morning she said no I let him sleep as long as he wants to (laughs) it's not always always easy to get along with one another and what's more it's not always easy to get along with those who are a part of the household of faith 
And it should not be a surprise. After all, Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Well, since that is the case, and it is, the enemy knows and the evil one knows that all he must do is sow seeds of discord among the brethren and get us to focus in on battling one another. And he has scored a great victory and gone a great length in convincing the world that Christ is not real. Now, let's just be honest, ladies and gentlemen, on this Sunday night. Tragically, too often, we're known more for what we're against than what we're for. Tragically, we're known more for our disagreements, our fusses, our fights, our business meetings than we are our harmony and our love and our unity. And by the way, might I add, I'm preaching a whole lot better than your amen on Sunday night. Can I get an amen from anyone? Now, all of this started when Simon Peter came to the Lord with a question. He was drawn into his presence. Jesus had been teaching in parables concerning the coming kingdom. In verse 15 and following, he talked about how to resolve your differences, how to go to your brother. Don't go tell others, but if you got a problem, you go tell your brother between you and him, you go. You don't bring everyone else into it, and if he'll hear you, you've gained a brother. If not, you bring someone else. If not, bring him before the church, and if he'll not hear the church, cast him out and treat him as a heathen. That's what the Word of God says. Well, undoubtedly, uh, Simon Peter had been mulling this over, and he's drawn into the Lord's presence in verse 21 with a question. Master, he asked, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I be required to forgive him? Seven times? Jesus said, you're not even close. I say not unto you seven times. It's as if the Lord is saying, I never said seven times. But rather I say unto you 70 times seven. Four things this evening we're going to look at as it relates to the subject of forgiveness. Firstly, the requirement of forgiveness. Now, I want you to notice it. Are you, are you getting this? Say amen. Simon Peter comes to the Lord and he says, how many times shall my brother sin against me? Now, did you notice the fallacy and the error in his question? How many times shall my brother sin against me? Well, Mr. Simon Peter, excuse me for stating the obvious, but why is it always your brother's fault? Does it always have to be the other person's fault? Is there not a rare exception to that? Maybe every once in a while it's not his fault, but it's your fault. And you know what? We see ourselves a whole lot in Simon Peter, if we're really honest. Because more times than not, we'd rather point fingers and blame others than assume responsibility. Now, I doubt very seriously that any of you are like this here tonight. But back where I come from in Louisiana, the men are a little hickory-headed. Who knows what I'm talking about? And a lot of the men that I know and associate with a great deal back home, if given the option between admitting their wrong or death, would gladly choose death any day over admitting their wrong. Can I get a witness? Ladies, don't look at your husband. Look right here at me. Focus, all right? It's not an easy thing for us to admit we're the ones that are wrong. It's much easier, is it not, to hurl insults and blame others than it is to assume responsibility for our own actions. And here is Simon Peter drawn into the Lord's presence with this question burning in his heart. How many times shall my brother sin, trespass, violate me, and I be required to forgive him? And then it's very interesting because he sort of shifts gears. He's asking a question, but now he becomes the Lord's counselor. How many times shall my brother sin against me? But he doesn't wait for an answer. He answers his own question, and he says seven times. I've noticed a lot of times that people in churches have a lot of questions. Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, oh, what do you think this verse means right here? And you know good and well if you just pause five seconds, they'll spend an hour waxing eloquent telling you what they know it means. Who knows what I'm talking about? They're not asking you because they really want to hear what you have to say. They're asking you so they can wax eloquent and brag about how much they know and, and overwhelm you with their intellect. Well, that's what Simon Peter's doing. How many times shall my brother sin against me and I be required to forgive him? And then he suggests seven times? Where did that number come from? The Jews taught three strikes and you're out. Perhaps he was convinced he would impress his master by saying seven times. And boy, Jesus turned to him, church, and he said, I never said seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, what exactly was the Lord trying to teach Simon Peter and thus teach us this evening concerning the requirement of forgiveness? He was teaching us that forgiveness is mandated. It's not optional. It's not a choice. It's not an elective. It's not even something we're to pray concerning whether we'll do. It is either obedience or rebellion. And everyone said amen. Oh. 
Now notice what he says. I never said seven. Seventy times seven. Forgiveness is to be unconditional. A lady came to the altar one time to pray with her pastor in her church, and she said, Pastor, I want you to know that someone hurt me many years ago. They wronged me. They're the ones to blame. And then she said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just wait on them to make the first move. And the pastor rather wisely said, do you know the model prayer? Boy, she stood strong and said, yes, I know the model prayer. He said, let's kneel here at the altar, and what I want you to do is you pray out loud the model prayer, and after you've concluded praying, I'll pray. Let's listen to see if the Lord has anything to say. And so she got on her knees, and she started praying that night at the altar, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then she prayed, and forgive us our debts. You see, church, 2,000 years ago when the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples how to pray, he instructed us to pray this way and forgive us our debts as or in the same way we forgive our debtors. So what we could all do tonight is as Jesus instructed us to do, we could get on our knees and we could pray, Father, forgive me the same way I forgive others. Jesus concluded that prayer by saying, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. There are 774,747 words in the Bible. 1,189 chapters, 31,323 verses. And all through the Bible there is a mandate that men ought always pray and not faint. Luke 18, 1. We're to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5. All throughout Scripture, there is a mandate that we must pray. Yet there's one time in the Scripture where we're prohibited from praying. In fact, Jesus says, do not pray. Do you know where it is? He said, you go to the altar to bring your gift, and there you remember your brother hath ought against you. Leave. That means desert. Get up. Walk away from your gift. Stop singing. Stop preaching. Stop testifying. Shut the service down. No more. Until you go be reconciled with your brother, then you come back and offer your gift. That's pretty powerful, yes or no? First Peter says, husbands and wives are to dwell together in unity lest their prayers be hindered. My greatest prayer partner is my wife. I'm thankful for you and others praying for me, but I'll guarantee you there's one person I never want them to stop praying for me, and that's my wife. There's never been a time that I know of in all of my ministry since that lady and I have been married where she's not prayed for me right before I preach. I'm grateful to have a praying wife. Amen? And the Bible says you better, listen, you better dwell together in unity. You can't pray effectively with your spouse and be mad and upset. My wife and I made a covenant before God. We'd never go to sleep a single night without resolving a conflict. Twenty years later, we've never gone to sleep one night without settling a dispute. Now, we've gone, I think, up to six or seven nights without sleep, but we've never gone to sleep. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) I just need to make sure you were awake. Amen. Jesus said, you go to the altar to bring your gift. You remember there, your brother hath ought against you. Leave your gift. Stop it. Don't crank the music louder. Don't preach harder. Don't preach louder. Don't preach longer. Stop it. Quit sweeping it under the rug and ignoring the obvious. Go, deal with it, then come back and offer your gift. For we're never more like Jesus than when we're willing to forgive. We're never more unlike Jesus than when we're unwilling to forgive. Can you tell me anything more ungodly than those of us who have tasted grace saying, I will not forgive? How many times shall my brother sin against me and I be required to forgive him? Seven times Jesus said, you're not even close He taught him that forgiveness is to be unconditional, but he also taught him it was to be unlimited. Not seven, but 70 times seven. Now, some of you in the room, you're mathematicians. You've gone on ahead. You've done the math. You you figured it out 490 times. And so now you think what you're going to do is go home and start keeping score. There's one. There's two. There's 100. There's, There's 400, 489. There's 490. That's it. No more forgiveness for you. Did you hear about the couple went to the pastor? The man said, Pastor, I really need some help. He said, what's wrong? He goes, every time we get in an argument, my wife keeps getting historical on me. The pastor said, you mean hysterical? He goes, no, I mean historical. Oh, come on, man. You mean hysterical? He goes, no, she keeps getting historical on me. What are you talking about? He goes, every time we argue, she brings up the past. Who knows what I'm talking about? 
You know, a lot of us are that way. We like to continue to bring up the past and bring up the past and bring up the past. Who's thankful tonight Jesus does not forgive that way? Amen? Who's thankful that Jesus doesn't come into the house and say, let me tell you about Jerry and let me tell you about all of you. I don't know a one of us that would want every thought we've had since we've been in the building tonight flashed on these screens for the rest of us to see. We can strut our stuff in here and act like we've got it all together, but I'll tell you deep down, in the dark is what we really are when it's us and God and God alone, and God knows the character and the integrity of our heart. Where would we be were it not for the grace of God to forgive us? Amen? Oh, my. I'm about to get stirred up. Is that all right? Can I get, can I get happy? Amen? Hmm. Is that okay? Forgiveness is a requirement. It's to be unconditional. It's to be unlimited. 1 Corinthians 13 declares love keeps no records of wrong. If we're keeping score, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is an act of the will. It's not an emotion. It's not us hugging each other and loving and patting on the back. It is a declarative act of the will to say, I choose to act as if the offense has never happened. And for me to continue to bring it up is surefire proof of the fact that I've never dealt with it. Forgiveness is a requirement. You still love me? I'm going to preach on liars in just a minute. You better tell the truth. <laughs> Secondly, I want you to notice the reason. Now, I can only imagine by now, Simon Peter thought, why did I ever open my mouth? Master, can I just withdraw the question? Did he ever get more than he bargained for? Jesus, in verse 23, says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like, and therefore, when you see a therefore, you know it. When you see a therefore, you ask what it's there for. It's a hinge upon which the door swings. The context is Simon Peter wants to know, how many times shall my brother sin against me? I be required to forgive him. Seven times, Jesus said, you're not even close. Seventy times seven. Therefore, in light of this, Simon Peter, because of this, let me tell you a story. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who would take account of his servants when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now what the Lord is doing is he's painted a picture, a vivid portrait of what it's like to be on the outside of grace wanting to get in. And now that you're in, taking a trip down memory lane and knowing what the kingdom of heaven is all about. He begins by displaying for us this man's debt. Here was a man that would take account of his servants when he had begun to reckon. That was an accounting word that meant to settle the books. One was led to him that owed him 10,000 talents. A talent in biblical days was the equivalent of 6,000 denarius or denarion or denarii. That was a day's wage. 6,000 days, one talent, 10,000 talents, 60 million days wage debt. Now, I grew up in southwest Louisiana. I'll be the first to confess I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack. But I'm smart enough to know that's a lot of money. Yes, a 60 million days wage debt. And I'll tell you what else I'm able to figure out. That's more days than anyone will ever live in 10 lifetimes. You can't live long enough to repay that. Here was a man brought before his master that was indebted and owed his master a 60 million days wage debt. Do you get the picture? Simon Peter, you're asking why you should forgive someone 490 times? Take a trip with me, Simon Peter. Do you remember what it was like when you were on the outside looking in? Do you remember what it was like when you were in need of mercy and grace and pardon and forgiveness? Do you remember? You weren't squabbling with what's the least I can do to get by. You were on the outside. You needed mercy. You came to me. You say, well, now, Brother Jerry, those 60 million day wage debt sinners, those are the bad sinners. I'm not a bad sinner. Well, what are you, a good one? I'm not a bad sinner. Well, who's a bad sinner? Well, that'd be... You know, Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein and Stalin and Hitler and all of those wicked and godly people. Those are bad sinners. I'm a church sinner. You know, I'm a good sinner. I'm a sophisticated sinner. I do more right than wrong. I do more good than bad. You know, after all, I'm not that bad. You know, you wouldn't believe me, but I'm telling you, back in the day, I used to play basketball. And back in the day, I used to dunk a basketball. You should have said Amen. I tried it the other day, almost had to go to the emergency room. Who knows what I'm talking about? Now, there's not a soul in this room that could jump, stand flat-footed and jump and touch that beam. Some could admittedly get closer. But whoever could get the closest, you still would fall short if that's the mark. 
Jesus is the mark. What good does it do you because you may think you get a little closer to the mark if you still don't reach the mark? We all have a debt we cannot pay. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you may think, well, I, I don't owe my master a 60 million days wage debt. But the issue is not the enormity of the debt. It's his depravity. For verse 25 says, but for as much as he had not to pay. If you reach your hand in your pocket and you're penniless and destitute and bankrupt and broke, it does not matter how much you owe. You're in the same ship as everyone else is. And that is, you have a debt you cannot pay. So what did he do? He got on his knees and cried out for mercy. This is Jesus recounting the story to Simon Peter who wanted to know why should I forgive my brother 490 times. He said, you had a debt you could not pay. You reached in your pocket. You were unable to pay the debt. What did you do? You got on your knees and cried out for mercy. And to top it all off, as soon as you did, you were pardoned. You were forgiven. The debt was paid. Is there anyone in this room that's picking up on this? Does the microphone work? Can everyone hear me? You want to know why you should forgive? Well, it's because if you have ever tasted grace, you know what it is to be forgiven. And see, we all had a debt we could not pay, and we came to the one who paid a debt he did not owe. Have you ever heard anyone say, I cannot forgive? Well, there's biblical reason. It's because they've never been forgiven. For when you scream, I cannot forgive, you're saying, I've never experienced forgiveness. For the only ones who can are those who have experienced what it is to have a debt they cannot pay. The reason for forgiveness. Is anyone listening? Say amen. You say, now preacher, what do you know about all of this stuff? Preacher, there are people that have hurt me. There are people that have mistreated me. There are people that have abused me. There are people that have, man, they've taken me to court. They've assassinated my character. And you know we're living in evil days, yes or no? We're living in days where people are just flat ugly. Can I get a witness? I saw a church sign the other day. It's probably my all-time favorite. Here's what it said on the marquee. It said, don't let the world kill you. Let us help. ha, <laughs> ha. And how many of you know there's a lot of churches that will help you, yes or no? And unfortunately, there's mean people that go to church. There's a lot of mean ones in the pulpits these days. But I'm just telling you, ladies and gentlemen, listen, it does not matter what anyone has done to you or done to me. It'll never compare to what we've done to Jesus, and he was willing to forgive us. We'll never be called upon to forgive someone near as much as he was willing to forgive us. <laughs> That's good preaching, man. Amen. The reason for forgiveness. Well, thirdly, I want you to keep going with me in the story down to verse 28. And notice the rejection. The Bible says, but the same servant, the one who had just been forgiven a 60 million days wage debt, the same servant went out and found. Now, to find means you're looking for. He wouldn't leave it alone. He went out looking for him. And he found a fellow servant that owed him 100 pence. For the sake of time, let's just get to it. A 100 days wage debt. The man pled for mercy. He refused took him by the throat, seized him, sent him to prison, debtor's prison, till he should pay all that was due. Now what's the picture? Listen carefully. You say, preacher, what kind of a human being would be forgiven a 60 million days wage debt and in turn refuse to forgive someone that owed him so little in comparison to what he had been previously forgiven? Well, truth be told, all of us in the room are as guilty as we can be. Amen? A lady, this has been a long time ago, a lady came to me and, and she said, uh, you, I, I hate to act it out, but you've got to get the full picture. You, you know you've had it. You know you've had it. When a sweet little lady walks up to you and she starts shaking that finger and that voice cracks and she gets right in your face and says, Sonny boy, who knows what I'm talking about? I was in a church the other day, and there was a lady in the choir, and I looked, and the first thought was, I bet she can whip her rear end. And I went up and told her, and she goes, yes, son, I can, and I can whip yours. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's what I'm talking about. I like people with spunk. And so this lady came up to me, and she was waving that finger at me, and 
She said, I'll have you to know, Sonny boy, someone hurt me, someone mistreated me. And then she gritted her teeth, and as angrily as she could, she said, and I'm going to make them pay. And then she said, now what do you think about that? I said, you really want me to be honest? She said, I do. I said, sweetheart, what would you say to me if I told you I'm going to take a bottle of poison, I'm going to drink the bottle of poison, and stand here and see how long it takes to kill you? Well, see, I think some of you are starting to get it. You're making them pay? Can I give you a little news flash? They're at home in their easy chair eating their bluebell. Amen? They're sleeping just fine. You're stressed out. You're popping pills. You're miserable. Psychologists tell us 97% of their patients would get up and walk out of the hospital and be cured. That's what they say. I'm not one. You read the report. They say 97% of their patients would get up and walk out of the hospital and be cured today if they'd learned to forgive. You drink the poison and anticipate someone else dying, and the only sad part of it is that you're deceived. They're doing fine. You honestly have convinced yourself they're going to come crawling into this room on their hands and knees and publicly declare, hear ye, hear ye, I'm to blame. You're right, I'm wrong. I've got a newsflash. It's not going to happen. And they're going on with life, and you're miserable, and unfortunately you're going to an early grave because you're allowing it to destroy you. I've got, I, I don't like telling this story. I really don't want to tell it. I love my mother. But my mother's in a nursing home tonight, and if you were to go visit her, you would learn that she's full of hate and full of bitterness. And within just five minutes of you meeting her as a complete stranger, she would tell you about her sister that she hates. But what you would not know is August 3rd, made 20 years ago, we buried her sister. I'm going to make them pay. And you make no one pay. You're the one that pays. It springs up as a root of bitterness. Are you listening? He that angers you controls you. I get tickled when these young girls come to me and say, I'm never going to be like my mama, to which I always say, you already are. <laughs> Amen? You drink the poison, you're expecting others to die, and you're the one dying. You've lost your joy, you've lost your song. You used to laugh, and now you can no longer laugh. You're miserable. You go home and your little poodle runs from you and hides under the bed. You're so mean. You're just mean. I said, you're just mean. And in the words of the theologian Taylor Swift, why do you have to be so mean? <laughs> well, at least you got something tonight, amen? You're just mean. One thing that should never characterize the body of Christ is meanness, ugliness, cunning, clever, shrewd, sharp, hurting remarks. This man had been forgiven a 60 million days wage debt, went out and found someone that owed him a 100 days wage debt, took him by the throat, refused to forgive. And the Lord is saying, it does not matter what anyone has ever done to you. It'll never compare to what we did to Jesus, and he was willing to forgive us. You'll never be called upon to forgive. How can you compare a 60 million days wage debt with a 100 days wage debt? And you know the answer, you can't. You do not know what they've done. You don't know. I'm not defending the actions of people who are malicious and violent and vile and wicked and even sometimes demon-possessed. There are many out there. I'm not asking you to justify their behavior, but I'm telling you, you don't have to be a victim. I'm telling you, you can go on with God. You can turn that over to him who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You can let go. And you know when we get, are y'all all listening? When we really get down to the nitty-gritty, the heart of the matter is it's pride. We just simply do not want to let go. We want to be judge and jury, and we want to hang on to our right to get even. Amen? Well, let's look at the final thing. 
And that is the results of unforgiveness. Hmm. The Bible says, the fellow servants, when they saw what was done, verse 31, were sorry and came unto the Lord all that was done. It's a picture of intercession in what we should do when we see others struggling with bitterness. Rather than telling the world, we go to the Lord and tell it to him on their behalf. Then the Bible says, very interestingly enough, that the Lord of the servant called this man. He summons this man before him, and he rebuked him. Did you notice this rebuke? He said, oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all of that debt because you asked me, and you should have been willing to forgive your fellow servant in the same way that I was willing to forgive you. And then the last two verses, I mean, they'll startle you, man. His Lord was wroth, angry, delivered him to the tormentors, one that would put a person on a torture rack and torture them. Delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Verse 35, watch it. So likewise, in similar fashion, in the same way, shall my heavenly Father do to you. Time out. Who's the you? You say, well, he was talking to the Pharisees and scribes. No, he was not. It all started when Simon Peter said, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I be required to forgive him? And now Jesus concludes the teaching with this statement. So likewise, or in the same way, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. There is no preacher, there is no person that can put revival in a suitcase. There are no experts on revival. Amen? Amen? I get very tired of this idea, well, if you do step one, two, three, God, no, no. God's God, he can do what he wants to. But I do believe we have to meet conditions. Amen? We, we can't demand of God, we can't argue with God and tell him what he has to do. But I tell you what we can do, position ourselves in, as, in such a place that we can receive I had a guy tell me two weeks ago, he said, Jerry, I don't know if we can be trusted with the glory of God in this nation anymore. You may not like the choice of the word scare. Find another one. But that scares me. Amen? Because if God checks out, I'm telling you right now, we're in trouble. Someone prayed this morning, God, if you do not show up, we'd be just as good to go home. Boy, I'm telling you, that's, that's right on. The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. Amen? And you know what always intrigues me in services like this? As I look around the room, and I'm not trying to highlight anything. You know, I'm sort of in a warp right now. Older people say I'm young. Younger people say I'm old. I don't know what I am. But I'm looking around at some of the older, the seasoned saints in the room, and I'm watching your eyes dance right now at the mere mention of the word revival because you've seen God move, and you know he can do it. And we, we've come to the point, at least God help us to get to the point, where we recognize that it's going to take more than business as usual to get the job done now. You remember when Jesus said, hey, this kind, they, the disciples wanted to know why couldn't we cast the demon out? And Jesus said, this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're up against in our culture. Now, we're going to have to get desperate and serious and get to God as quickly as we can. Amen? And, and so no one has a formula for revival. (laughs) But I can tell you, you don't know of any place where God has really moved in great glory and in great power where there's bitterness, resentment, hatred, unforgiveness. You'll never see it. One of the greatest services I've ever been a part of, it was in a Baptist church, it was on a Sunday night, and this has been 15 years ago, 15 years ago. The service went to 11.35 at night. Now now listen, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just the length of the service, 
You know if God's not there, five minutes seems like an eternity. But if God's there, you can be there all night and wonder, boy, where'd that go, right or wrong? And it was just one of those. And, it, and I'm telling you, we were about to dismiss the service, and a man said, can I have a word? And that makes every preacher nervous. And so he got up, and he just broke, and he apologized to the church for some stuff. He got specific about some stuff, how he had hurt his family in the church. And, man, I'm telling you, God just showed up. You know, at the end of the day, we want to be right. Well, let me try that one again. At the end of the day, we just want to be right. We just want to be right. Someone told you when you were growing up, you got to forgive and that's what they told you. And they tell you very forcibly and they insinuate, if you do not forget, you've not forgiven. That's how you were taught, correct? That's how I was taught. So let's talk about it biblically very quickly as we get ready to stop. Who in the room remembers things people have said about you or have done to you? Raise your hand. Tell the truth and shame the devil. Don't you lie in church. Yeah, but we all believe if you don't forget, you've not forgiven. Well, where, where did you get that? See, short of you having memory failure and me having memory failure, you're not going to forget. Now, Brother Gary would never do this. But if he were to walk up right now and just punch me in the nose and break my nose, I'll guarantee you, as long as I lived, I'll never forget it. Word would probably travel around Warner Robins rather quickly too, amen? Now, if he were to do that and I were to just go home and forget and see him tomorrow, I wouldn't need mercy, grace, prayer, faith, help. Psst, psst, I forgot. The problem with me, and I'm admitting this to you, is if I were to see him tomorrow and he were to do that, I'd be thinking, how can I get him? Church, come on, get honest. Amen? You're not always reciting your Sunday school lesson. Tell the truth up in here. Amen? And if I were to see him tomorrow, I'd be thinking, how can I? And the reason I need mercy, grace, and help is because I have a memory. And I can run to the altar tonight and say, God, help me. Then tomorrow I bump into him down aisle six. And I'm reminded all again, and now I've got to deal with it again. And I know you're going to want to find it in the Bible. I'll ask you to wait till you get home tonight and look it up. But the Bible does not say what we think it says when we think it says God forgives and forgets our sin, which is what we think is the biblical justification for why you should forget. It says he forgives your sin never to remember him against you anymore. And the beauty of grace is not that he forgets your sin, it's he knows everything you've done, when you've done it, and what you would have done if you thought you could have got away with it. And yet because of the blood of Jesus, he chooses to no longer hold it against you. I'm about to get stirred up, amen? <laughs> That's grace, amen? He knows everything I've thought, everything I've said, everything I've wanted to say, everything I've wanted to do. They say it, if you think it, you may as well say it. Horrible advice. If you think it, only God knows it. If you say it, you bring others into it. And the beauty of God's grace is not that he forgets your sin. It's that he knows everything you've done, but because of Calvary, he chooses to no longer hold it against you. And forgiveness is when you say, I know everything you've said and everything you've done, but I choose because of Jesus to free you, act as if it never happened, and go on. Amen? We're almost done. Just some housekeeping matters as we bring this plane in for a landing. Firstly, private sin means private confession. If you've got bad thoughts toward another individual and the only one that knows it is you and God, keep it there. Why under heaven would you go to someone else and say, I need you to forgive me? Why? I've hated your guts for six months. Why would you ever need to say that unless you have ulterior motives? If you've got thoughts that you're struggling with toward another individual and they don't have a clue, don't go bring them into it. Get on your knees, tell it to Jesus, leave it there. And that also would go for husbands and wives and would probably help you out. 
Secondly, personal sin means personal confession, which means if me and this brother right here are at odds and I know it and he knows it, I need to repent before God, but I need to go make restitution. Now let's talk about that very quickly so we don't misunderstand. I go in the right spirit. I don't go to win the argument. I don't go to make him repent. You make no one repent. God does that. You don't go to someone and say, I forgive you. You don't go to battle it out. Brother Jerry, what do I do if I go to someone and they will not receive it? Let me give you a verse. As much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. That means there's just some instances where you'll do all you can do and they won't receive it. What do you do? Leave it alone. Don't just keep picking at the scab. Give it to Jesus. Let him do it. It took you a year, two years to deal with it. Why can't you trust the Holy Spirit to give others time to repent? Personal sin means personal confession. You've got a problem with another, go get it settled. If I were in church tonight at odds with my son or my daughter, I'd go get it settled. Life is too short. I'm thankful to God when I buried my brother, my sister, and my dad that it was all settled. I'm glad I don't have to go through life with regret wondering what could have been. I'm glad the business was dealt with. Are you listening to what I'm saying? You take it from someone that worked in the funeral business, that's not always the case. And it'll eat at you. (laughs) Personal sin means personal confession. You go with the right spirit. Listen, brother, I'm sorry. And I'm not here to argue and I'm not here to rehash anything. I'm just here to ask you to forgive me. You know, I just want to be right with the Lord and I want to be right with you. And I just ask you to forgive me. I love you. And I just don't want to live life like this. I don't want this stuff consuming me. I'm sorry. Practice it with me. Say it out loud. I'm sorry. Say it again. Say it again. Say, that's not that bad. That's not that bad. You can choose to go through life always right, or you can choose to say, God, I want to be right with you. Your choice. You'll not have it both ways. Now, here's the third thing, and I close with this. And this is where it's going to get quiet. Wake your husband up. This is the controversial part. Public sin means public confession. Which means if you drag the name of our Lord through the mud publicly, you better deal with it publicly. I was in a revival outside of Little Rock. I think it's been two and a half, three years ago. And we were about to dismiss the service, and this sweet, sweet girl... um, I'd say maybe middle 20s from the balcony came and she walked down and I could see her just crying and was talking with their pastor. And he had everyone to sit down and she took the microphone and she, well, she was just broken. I mean, it wasn't put on. It, it, she was broken. And here's what she said. She said, church family, you know how much shame I brought to my mom and to my dad. And you know how I've been living and you know how I've acted. I've been a disgrace to our Lord, and I've been a disgrace to you as my church family. And she said, I'm begging you to forgive me. Do you think those people said, go on? They ran to her. And Jesus was in the house. There's just something about when we just forgive. Yes or no? Folks, you've got to understand there's a spiritual aspect to this. People don't act at work like they act at church. It doesn't rub you the wrong way when you see someone at work and they don't talk to you like it does when you're at church. Why is that? It's because the evil one wants to put thoughts in your mind. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he loves to do it, and he masters at doing it. You see Pastor Jim, and and he's walking through the hall, and you you, you don't have a clue what's on his mind. And the devil, if you're not careful, will put a thought in in your mind. Well, he just snubbed you. And you you don't know what someone may have just told him and what's on his heart. Are you listening? I would hope if you came to my home and I got angry and slammed the door, I would hope you'd give me the benefit of the doubt. I would hope that you would say, you know, Brother Jerry's having a bad day. He didn't get much sleep last night. Something's going on. I'm going to forgive him. Now, if I slammed the door every time you came over, you could conclude he's got a problem with this. But why are we so quick to jump on the bandwagon and beat people up? Love covers 
a multitude of sins. Amen? And I'm telling you, the household of faith ought to be a place where we can run to as the family of God and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen? We're never more like Jesus than when we're willing to forgive. We're never more unlike Jesus than when we're unwilling to forgive. Here's the question, and we're going to pray. Are you listening? Is there anyone in your life, living or dead, that you have yet to forgive? 